That everybody loves. <laughs> all right, well, good evening, and uh, thank you all for having me here tonight. Um, I'm Tom Jordan with the San Joaquin Valley Air District. Um, just a little bit about me. I've, I've been with the district at the end of this next month. It'll be 27 years. So I've done a variety of things since I've uh, joined is the he, agency. Um, some of my primary focuses now, I work on legislation for the district. And then I also work with our transportation agencies on transportation issues throughout the valley and, and, and often rep represent the district on the Regional Policy Council looking at valley-wide issues. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I plan on talking about a couple of things. Um, one of them is AB 617, which is a fairly new program for air districts throughout the state. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, some issues that have come up with the uh, at the federal level with California's waiver to control emissions from light duty vehicles and how some of that interplays with some of the work that KernCog does. Uh, and then finally, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the fact that we, we have grant money available, and in Kern County in particular, there's a lot of money available right now to replace heavy duty equipment. So I wanted to encourage any of you that have connections to, to do outreach to folks that might be interested in that. So uh, AB 617 um, w is a program that, that passed out of the state's effort to uh, extend the greenhouse gas reduction program or the, the global warming program uh, at the state level. Um, initially, AB 32 was the state's first foray into, um, into controlling greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that program was set to expire in 2020. Um, one of the main tools, that uh, or one of the biggest tools uh, to help them do that was called the cap and trade program, where large industrial sources could buy and sell credits to uh, reduce emissions, and it generated a lot of revenue throughout the state. Uh, and so at the time that they were looking to extend the greenhouse gas reduction program, they also wanted to extend that cap and trade program. And more importantly, they wanted to change it from a, what was called a fee under California law into a tax. And the reason they wanted to do that was there's a lot of requirements on fees and, and that they be spent in relation to the program and some of the things the state wanted to spend the money on there were some legal challenges to that, so they wanted to eliminate the ambiguity and, and create a tax out of the cap and trade program. Um, business interests throughout the state and, and the conservatives at the Capitol weren't enamored with extending the, uh, the climate change program um, or the cap and trade program. But because of California law, the, the legislature could extend the requirements to reduce greenhouse gases with a simple majority vote. The cap and trade program required a supermajority vote. And so the first year when the legislature was looking at doing that extension, they were able to get that simple majority. So they extended the requirement to reduce greenhouse gases from 2020 to 2030. They increased the amount of reductions business had to get, but they took one of the, they, they weren't able to extend the primary tool, which is the cap and trade program that gave businesses flexibility in how they met that requirement because they couldn't get a two thirds vote because they needed some more conservative votes. So the next year, the, the legislature convened, and the business community was there, and they said, OK, you, you extended our requirements. Now we want the cap and trade program extended. And the environmental community said, well, if you want that, we want something in return. 
AB 617 is what the environmental community asked for in return. And there was a few new requirements that were placed uh, on air districts and, and others throughout the state. Um, the one that's gotten the most attention that I'll, it, and has, has played out here in Kern County is the state identified communities that had large industrial facilities in, in them throughout the state. And air districts were required to develop community emission reduction plans in those communities. Um, prior to that, most air quality plans were to deal with region-wide air quality problems. These plans that have to be community-based and very focused on these communities that maybe have large industrial sources. Also, air districts are required to go and look at our regulations. Um, we do this on a regular basis anyway, but they accelerate the schedule where we had to show that all of our regulations meet what's called best available retrofit control technology. So we basically have to show that all of our rules are as stringent as any other air districts within the state. Um, we had to do some work on emissions inventory uh, and reporting for s facilities. A lot of this had to do with making sure everyone was doing it the same way throughout the state uh, and um, making that data very publicly available. Um, so there's some requirements on that. And then one of the main focuses of the program is public engagement. They really wanted air districts to be involved with the community and talking to the communities about what they wanted to see uh, to reduce emissions. If we can go to the next slide. That's all right. So uh, here in the San Joaquin Valley, we went through that first phase of looking at our, our regulations um, to see if we, we meet the best available retrofit control technology requirements. Um, we, w one of the things here in the Valley is because of our severe air quality challenges, in general, our rules meet those requirements. There are a couple. Um, as we went through that analysis, uh, three that we think we're going to have to do some minor tweaks to, but no major changes. That isn't the case like in Southern California and LA. In LA, they're going to have to do some wholesale changes to their rule book through this requirement. But for us, this ended up not being a, a major issue. Um, so it, it, you will see some rules change to meet that BARC requirement, but you aren't going to see some, any major changes on stationary sources of pollution. Um, on the community emission reduction plans, uh, the first year, uh, the state had, had the requirement to go through and look throughout the state and identify which communities uh, would have these specific plans developed for them. Um, they selected 10 communities throughout the state uh, for air districts to do this intensive work in. Uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, they identified two communities. Uh, we'd recommend it some more, but uh, they selected South Central Fresno and the city of Shafter as the two communities for us to develop specific community emission reduction plans for. Um, the Air District also nominated North Bakersfield, but North Bakersfield was not selected in that process. So in each of these communities, uh, I mentioned the, the extensive public engagement process. We established community steering committees to meet with us. Um, th there was a lot of interest in being on those committees from environmental advocates, from business groups, and from residents. Um, each of those communities we went through and developed a charter, and, and in those charters it requires that um, a majority of the committee must be residents. So those other groups can participate, but we want it, we, we really want to hear from the community um, about uh, what their issues are air quality wise within their areas. Um, those other groups, like I said, more than welcome to participate, but we just, we, we want to make sure we are hearing actually from the community and not necessarily just from advocates. Um, the Shafter community, uh, the area that was selected was, uh, uh, basically, the, the city of Shafter, um, and then the community was interested in some of the impacts from the surrounding areas. So while it's not part of the selected community, um, based upon request from the steering committee, they also wanted us to look at a seven-mile radius around the community and look at ish air quality issues within that seven-mile radius um, and how they impacted the city of Shafter as we did this work developing the specific plan for, for the Shafter community. Um, down at the bottom there, you'll see the Cal, Cal screen model scores. So um, Cal screen is a model to look at environmental impacts on a community and other challenges uh, such as poverty uh, in a community. And Shafter scored very high on those 90th percentile over, overall, 98th percentile for, for poverty and 84th percentile for pollution burden. So that was part of the reason they were selected. The other reasons Shafter was selected is the state wanted to um, have a variety of communities, and Shafter was selected as 
kind of their model of a rural community, and they're hoping that some of the things we learned from that process can be applied to other communities. Um, the South Central Fresno community is much more urban. It's a lot larger uh, area. It's 35 square miles. Um, Population-wise, Shafter was like, I think, 19,000, if I remember correctly. Uh, the Fresno population within the community is 150,000. Um, again, scored very high on those, um, on those uh, scores on Cal Enviro screen. Um, much more industrial uh, than, the, than the Shafter community. You have a lot of warehouse and distribution facilities. Um, there's a glass plant within the community. There's a, uh, a biomass facility operating still in the community. And, and a lot of other heavy industry, so it's a little bit different situation than Shafter. Um, so ARB identified these communities in September of 2018. Our requirement was to have a plan to the Air Resources Board by September 2019. Um, and that seems like, well, you got a year. Um, there's, there was a lot to get done in a year. I mean, we had to identify a community we had to identify a mon we had to develop a monitoring plan and place new air quality monitors and there was a lot of work base work to do a lot of work to do with the committee to as far as education about air quality and and what issues uh, they were they had to deal with the committee had to figure out how they were going to govern themselves figure out how they were going to move forward and so we met it st it started off um, with monthly meetings but uh, it became clear that we're going to have to meet more often than that to meet the deadline so it started being every two weeks so it was a very intensive process that we went through uh, to develop a plan um, also with that the community outreach goals of the program um, all the materials were translated into spanish um, for the process the programs uh, all the meetings were live streamed on the web um, and record it. They're all still available. You, you guys want to watch them? They're, you can spend all the time you want watching them, um, but they're there. Um, <clears throat> and the meetings were all held in the evening. That was the, uh, the interest of the committee. They thought that was the best way to get uh, the most people from the public to engage. Next, please. So this is just some pictures from, from the process. Um, it wasn't just the Air District. There were other issues in particular in Shafter that the com committee was interested in. Uh, one of the issues that Shafter was very interested in was pesticides. And so we had entire meetings that were de dedicated to the Department of Pesticide Regulation coming down and talking to Shafter about their plans and um, some of their monitoring of pesticides and some of the, the things that could be done. Um, also, the state, um, a lot of the issues are mobile source related. We as the local air district don't control mobile sources. It's more of a state issue. And so the state was there to talk about um, their control of mobile sources. Um, we also, if, if any of you are interested in seeing the information from this process, um, on our website, valleyair.org, if you click on AB 617, both of these communi communities basically have their own web pages with all the information from the process, all the agendas from all the meetings, all the plans, the monitoring plan, that information is all available there. Um, and so it was designed not only for a place for the committee to go, but also anyone else that was interested in getting educated on the issue. We tried to make the information more approachable to the general public. Um, air quality can be pretty dense stuff sometimes, a lot of real technical information. <clears throat> and we went through an extensive process to make it uh, more understandable. So when you look at the, the resources, like the emissions inventory data, uh, you know, typically if you, you ask an air quality person for their emissions inventory, it's, it's pages and pages of tables um, with different you know, tons per day, pounds per day, and all that. So we tried to come up with graphical um, information so people in the chapter could see where the emissions were coming from, um, what sources they were coming from, and, and kind of educate them. Um, they could, you can see it with, the, with those spatial maps. You can see where the schools, hospitals are, where areas of concern in the community were. So it was very useful for the committee. Um, again, just information about where the emission sources are, where sensitive receptors are. And, so, and again, that's all available on our website if anyone's interested in looking. So like this, for instance, when you look at those... Um, those column bars, those are based upon the size of emissions, so it was a real graphical way to present the information. So um, th this whole process culminated in um, this last summer developing a long list of measures that we'd implement in each of the communities. Um, along with 617, there was also some funding for incentive programs. Um, the San Joaquin Valley got about $60 million to spend 
um, in those communities and to benefit those communities valley-wide so that those incentives can go for uh, replacing heavy-duty equipment, uh, could go for um, do, doing uh, all sorts of mitigation that the community was interested in. Um, so some of those programs were ongoing already, and so we were spending money even before the plans were, were, uh, were finished. Um, but definitely, um, as the community came up with ideas, those went on a list and we identified where potential funding could come for, for each of those, those measures. Um, when fully implemented, um, this, the, the, the emission reduction program in Shafter is expected to reduce um, PM 2.5 by 265 tons per, per year. Um, that's about a ton per day. Um, these days, that's a lot of emission reductions for, for PM uh, in, a, in an area the size of Shafter. And for NOx, and NOx is a pollutant that is both an issue for PM and ozone here in the San Joaquin Valley. They're, they're estimating 1,718 tons per year for, for, for NOx emission reduction. So that's, that's a very large emission reduction. Um, this is just an example. When you go in the SERP, the, uh, the SERP at the Community Emission Reduction Plan, um, there's tables with all the measures that were identified, um, and, and it shows funding for each of those, those, those measures. Um, also, as I mentioned, some of these measures we don't have the authority to implement. We're the ones that developed the plan. So we can't make commitments for other agencies. We don't have any new authority uh, to do any, like in Fresno in particular, there were a lot of issues with land use. There was some, some desire to change land use designation, change traffic flow patterns. That's outside of our purview. So we, we identified the issue, identified what government agencies would need to be involved, and we're willing to p play a facilitator role um, but we're not making any commitments on behalf of any of those entities, like DPR, for instance, with pesticides. Um, we invited them down into the process. We're willing to facilitate that conversation, but uh, we can only do what we originally had authority to do. There's no new authority as far as this program to reduce emissions. Uh, so we finished the first year. Um, our board adopted these community emission reduction programs in September. Um, they've now been submitted to CARB. Uh, for their approval. Um, CARB will be coming and having a meeting uh, in Shafter for both of our communities in February of next year to <clears throat> take action on those plans, either approve or, or not approve. Um, we hope they approve those plans. We, we went through a lot of work with the community to make sure we were doing what we heard as the community will in those plans, and we hope the state sees that as well. Um, but they're already working on next year. So the state's looking at selecting communities for next year. Um, and, and we as the Air District have, have recommended um, two communities uh, to the state, um, Stockton, an area around the port of Stockton, and then <coughs> Arvin and Layton is the other area that we've recommended to the state. Um, they will actually be selecting communities for the second year of the program at their December board meeting. Um, I believe it's December 13th, uh, or right, I'll, I'll have to make sure of the date, but it's right around there. Uh, go ahead. And so here's just a, a, an outline of the area in Stockton. You guys probably aren't that interested in that, so next. And then Leighton and Arvin. Um, so there's an opportunity to kind of finalize. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Leighton. I'm, I, I'm from Fresno, so I got latent stuck in the brain, but uh, I, I apologize for that. Um, so anyway, they will be deciding next month on, on those communities. Um, we have heard uh, from the state, uh, both from the state legislature and from uh, the, st they've tempered expectations for year two of the program. Uh, they selected 10 uh, communities the first year. Um, we've gotten indications that there probably won't be 10 in the second year, so we'll see what happens uh, with these recommendations when, when CARB makes their final decision. Um, so now we're on to implementation with our two communities that we have right now. Um, so we, we continue to meet with, with, both, uh, with both Arvin and, and South Central Fresno. Uh, we continue to do outreach to those other entities that can help us with those programs. and. Uh, we aren't waiting for ARB to approve the community emission reduction programs. We're implementing them now, so we're, we're starting that work uh, looking forward. So that pretty much covers AB 617. Um, I'm, I'll be happy to take questions you guys may have about the program. Um, 
One of the other things that uh, a big discussion as they were recommending communities for year two is <clears throat> most air districts are saying we're fine with doing these as long as the state continues with the funding. And so these programs aren't cheap. Um, holding night meetings uh, on that type of a, of a continuous process, I'm not, aside from even the projects, the project funding is vitally important as well, but even the, the, the funding for monitoring for staff, um, it's not a cheap program. And so a lot of people have talked about, hey, we're willing to do more communities as long as the state comes through with the money. So we're gonna have to see what comes out in the governor's budget also in January and as the legislature goes through that process. So that's 617. Um, the other issue I had uh, got questions about was the federal waiver. Um, so you've probably heard, seen in the news, there's this battle between California and the Trump administration over the regulation of, of uh, light duty automobiles, in particular dealing with uh, fuel economy standards. <coughs> and the Trump administration has proposed uh, rescinding California's authority to set those standards. Um, under the Federal Clean Air Act, there's only one state that has the authority to set uh, emission standards for cars. Uh, that's reserved for the federal government, except for California. The Federal Clean Air Act gave California the authority to request a waiver from the federal government to set those standards. And then other states have a choice of staying with the federal standard or opting into the California standard. So California applied for a waiver. Uh, to implement their latest phase of, st of standards for tailpipe standards for light duty autos. Um, they received that waiver um, and the Trump administration's proposal is to rescind that waiver and then also uh, try to rescind California's authority going forward as well. Um, so when we do our air quality plans, we assume certain things are gonna happen into the future based upon commitments that others have made and so the state, um, we, we do stationary sources, so factories and all that, so we have our control measures. We project forward how much emission reduction we're gonna get from those measures. The state has their regulations on cars, trucks, fuels, that kind of things. We project forward how much emission reduction they're gonna get, and there's an emissions model they use to do that called the impact model. Um, and, and then th those commitments become a federally enforceable commitment. They're, we're required to get all those reductions, and if we don't, and we don't replace them with other reductions, we can be sanctioned. So losing the waiver puts a hole in our, in our, our plan for those commitments that the state had made. Um, now, how does that impact KernCog? Um, there's, a, there's another requirement in the Federal Cleaner Act that says <coughs> that any federal action has to conform with the air plan for that, for that area. They call it conformity. And for transportation, when KernCog wants to spend federal dollars, they have to show that their emissions are staying within those emission levels that we've committed to in our plan. They call it an emissions budget. And so um, if, if you lose it, you set the emissions budget assuming certain reductions were gonna happen and they don't happen, Kern Cog ends up in a situation where it's difficult for them to show that they're, they're meeting their emission budget to spend federal dollars. There's another requirement that when they do those assumptions, they have to they have to use basically they call it the most recent planning assumptions. It basically means they need to be using real real world information. So they can't just ignore the fact that the waiver was gone and use the old calculation. They have to show that they're using the most recent numbers. So if the emissions model includes assumptions that are no longer valid, that can invalidate the use of the emissions model. So in the short term, the loss of the waiver it's not finalized yet. California sued and we'll see where the lawsuit goes, um, could create a so short-term problem where Kern Cog could be in a situation that they don't have a valid emissions model to use to add any new federal dollars to a transportation plan or to move projects forward and could end up halting transportation projects. Now, everyone's well aware of this in the, st in the state, the COGS and their, their state, a their state uh, association, Caltrans, others, the State Air Resources Board, and people are, are working through a solution to try to make sure that doesn't happen, but I can't say today that there's a solution in place uh, to do that. So it is a potential problem uh, going forward. Um, I mentioned California sued. California has asked for um, you know basically um, the status quo to be in place until that lawsuit's dispensed with, but that hasn't been heard yet in federal court. So again, we're in limbo at this point. Um, there's a lot of other activity around this issue. We had some auto manufacturers say they're gonna voluntarily meet California's requirements 
we had others say no we're going to go with the federal requirement so um it's it's clear as mud at this point uh but i just want to make you guys aware that there could be fallout and and i don't know if aaron wants to say anything on the on the topic as well or um i, th I think th all i'll say is uh, it's being litigated it's not likely to be resolved anytime soon because arb has uh, requested permanent injunctive relief instead of temporary so uh, it's going to be a while yeah so uh anyway stay tuned and i'm sure kern cog will keep you guys apprised as that goes forward as as you know other solutions come up or as you guys start running into some issues uh on that um finally i wanted to talk about um our incentive programs uh i mentioned that we don't have authority to regulate stationary sources our main tool for getting reductions, I mean, for, uh, regulate mobile sources, our main tool to get emission reductions from mobile sources is through incentive programs. And we've been very aggressive to bring dollars to the Valley to do that. So basically what we do is we'll offer someone money. They may have a truck or a tractor that's still working for them, but there's a newer one out there that's cleaner. <coughs> and so we'll pay part of the cost of the new piece of equipment and they scrap their old piece of equipment, we get the emission reduction, they get a new piece of equipment. Usually for the tractor, it's, it, it usually works out, it's not exact, but it usually works out to about a 50-50 cost share on, on those projects. Um, for trucks, um, the trucks just have to be compliant with the state fleet rule, and then we can also provide some funding for the, for the trucks. Kern County, for a variety of reasons, has um, more money available than usual right now. Um, one of those is through a CEQA, process that the oil industry went through um, on new oil exploration, they've committed to fund a mitigation program to get additional emission reductions in Kern County. And so that money's coming to, our, to the local air district to be spent in Kern County on emission reduction projects. Um, it's flowing through our, our standard emission reduction programs. There's, the commitments have been to get certain cost per ton to make sure it's cost effective. Uh, for the oil industry, so it's mostly those heavy-duty equipment programs. But if you know anyone <coughs> who's uh, interested or potentially interested in replacing a truck or a tractor and the like, um, have them contact our agency, and and hopefully we can we can get them some funding. A lot of other parts of the valley, there's a, quite a waiting list for the funds, but in Kern County right now, there are there are dollars available. So I would encourage you guys to reach out to to whoever you might know. And with that, I'll stop talking and take some questions. I, Probably, I didn't mean to filibuster, but I think I used almost all the time. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, the Air District's been very successful, I think, over the last 20, 25 years, and I, and I like to hear those numbers uh, because people still, air quality is the number one concern. And and if you could just state real quick what, what progress we have made in the last 20 years or so. Yeah, so... Um, the first thing I'll say is that, that everyone around the table, the air quality that you're breathing today is, is cleaner than the air quality at any point in your life. Um, the emission reductions have been dramatic. Um, it's hard for people to see that, and the reason is that the way the Federal Clean Air Act works is every five years they go back and they readdress the standards. So while we're non-attainment, the, the standards were non-attainment for are a lot more, a lot tighter than the standards that we used to be non-attainment for. Um, stationary sources, so like factories uh, and businesses throughout the valley have reduced their emissions by 85 to 90 percent since the early 1990s. Um, for light duty autos, it's at about 98 percent. For trucks and heavy equipment, they've lagged a little behind, but they're catching up. They're probably more in the, the 80 percent range. So the air quality is dramatically cleaner. We're, uh, when I first started the Air District in 1990, we were non-attainment for what was called the one hour ozone standard. We've met that standard. We are non-attainment for the PM10 standard, which is basically dust particles. We've met that standard. Um, the first PM2.5, which is small particle standard like soot, um, we've actually, the 24 hour standard, we've met that standard. So while we're, we, we keep pushing farther and the goalpost keeps moving, um, we're, we're making dramatic pro progress. We aren't here to say we, you know, we've, we fixed everything. But, but the air quality is, ex is dramatically cleaner than at any point during any of your lives. So, Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, questions, comments? Absolutely. Mr. Couch, <coughs> Supervisor. First of all, Tom, thank you for coming all the way down here. You came all the way down from Fresno, so we appreciate you yeah. making the trip. Um, two things. There's a zero emission truck study that, and I'm going to ask the 
director to remind me. It's Kerncog, Caltrans, and I think we asked the Air District to partner on that as well. Is that, am I right about the three? So, uh, Supervisor Couch, um, uh, Kern Cog is the agent for the Eight Valley Cogs. Okay. So, the, the partners are uh, the Eight Valley Cogs, and with Kern Cog as the lead, uh, Air Resources Board, a state agency, Caltrans, and the Air District. And, and Tom, what we're looking for is, is just a <laughs> commitment uh, of the match that we verbally agreed to yeah. in writing so we can move forward. So right. we, yeah, we, we beat you We beat you up before the meeting, but we're, we're the, with the, the beating continues, I guess. Um, so I, I, I raised that because I remembered it. I forgot it earlier during the, the caning. Um, <laughs> But yeah. So if you could bring that back, I, I um, will. We we can do that. That's we have made the verbal commitment, so it's just a matter of sending it in right. Okay, and, th and this really isn't for you, but it's. Uh, I think it's important, really important for us, to do everything we can to get the Arvin Lamont communities in next year's study, um, or what do they call them? Communities of study or study communities? Yeah, AB six seventeen communities. Okay. Or, yeah. <clears throat> um, would it be out of bounds, um, Mr. Akimi, for the for the COG board to take an action where, I, and I think it'd be important for us to send a letter that would say it would be a unanimous vote. So if somebody's opposed to that, that's okay. Uh, but I wouldn't want to take a vote because I think it should be a unanimous position of Kern COG that we'd like to see those uh, communities. I, I can bring a supervisor couch. I can bring a resolution to our next meeting in January. Okay. I, I, I think uh, if anybody has an issue with that, I understand, but I don't. I don't know why we would. I just think it's important for us. Stockton got a, got ahead of this game because they just spoke up early, and I think it's just imp they they can have fewer communities or communities next next year. Is Car Carb is the one making the decision, right. but I think if we make a little noise and we just they're, they're not they're going to do what they want to do unless we tell them we want something different so i think it's important that we just speak up so thank you aaron uh, one more thing supervisor couch or, yep. or this is for tom tom all the incentives that you talked about just to be crystal clear uh you have representatives from all of kern county only apply to the valley portion of kern county yep. is that correct yeah that is correct i, I apologize for not good, making that good distinction. Point. thank you tom i have a question uh, regarding the selection, um, first year selection for the communities, I was wondering how was how was that process? Were communities asked to apply for this, or um, did s um, the uh, people in charge decided which communities were going to be part of it? So there were multiple pathways for a community to get nominated, uh, and and there still is. Um, through the CARB process. So we as the Air District went through a process. Um, we went to our board and said, hey, here's the, here's the things we think should be considered in determining which communities are nominated. It was a very analytical type of a process. And so we came up with some recommendations um, and, and nominated a few communities. Like I mentioned, one of them wasn't, wasn't finally selected. But communities could also self-nominate. So um, there were a number of communities, including Shafter, where it was advocates from the community that approached the state and said, we, we think we should be selected as a 617 community. Um, the final decision, as Supervisor Couch mentioned, is made by the California Air Resources Board. Um, but those nominations, they don't have to come from the Air District. The Air Districts do um, go through a process to say, we think these are communities that meet the requirements under the bill and have the biggest pollution burden and the most other issues to deal with. Uh, but the communities themselves can definitely step up and ask to be included. Right. I represent Wasco, and what I'm thinking is uh, the air is not stagnant. You know, it, you're going to be working in Shafter to reduce um, pollution. Uh, chances are that Wasco will benefit from that reduction as well. Um, but I would like to see Wasco included also as part of this community's uh, participating in, in the uh, pollution reduction. Um, and I just wanted to find out how the process went. And now we have a second year, which is uh, the December 13, the decision will be made. So it's coming right around the corner. I don't object to uh, Supervisor Couch, uh, what he's saying that uh, Arvin Lamont should be included. All of our communities uh, suffer from the same problem. So anyway, that, that, go Yeah, ahead. and, and uh, definitely um, these intense community plans are, are, are you know they're they're focused on that community and and we're bringing a lot of resources and we're bringing a lot of attention. I'll make one thing really clear though is that 
we're still a regional air district and we're still doing all the things we do valley wide uh, to control emissions as well but but i i totally understand a community wanting that intense focus to look at their issues and um you can't you know the, the two processes work together but that intense focus and listening to the community and finding out what the community concerns are and really focusing in on a list to do is, is definitely maybe a, a step above what's happening everywhere else in the valley. Well, uh, and I can tell you, for example, we have Highway 46 in Wasco that you know crosses the city, and we have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, truck traffic uh, going through there all the time. It's slow traffic. They're adding to the pollution in town. So that would be something that we would probably be different than other communities. Yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions? I may have one question. Merkel. Uh, thank you. Down here. Um, there's a comment. I, I do a lot of traveling, especially in California, down in Pruitt Valley and stuff. But it seems like wherever I go, different cities, they always say they have the worst quality air. Is there a spot in California where air quality is a lot better or you don't hear it's the worst quality? I know we're trying to fight the pollution and make a better lifestyle, but I think all over California is always the worst uh, yeah. quality. And second, what the, uh, the, the, the good part about the pros what, on these communities to find out what there are with the pollutions and trying to eradicate it or lower the, the PNCs and the, and the uh, other stuff. But what's the, the cons on that? To, is it when they do try to reduce to pollution, is it by through better equipment, better uh, uh, motors and stuff that meet the part tier three or tier four in order to reduce the pollution in those cities? Well, well I, I can tell you, so everything's on the table when we go into the community. Um, but as I mentioned, um, the community is expressing their desire, but um, the, the, any, any, any regulation or other thing that would come out of this process has to go through the body that has the authority to make those decisions. So the community might su suggest, hey, we, we think such and such should be done to, uh, just for instance, at Southwest Fresno, one of the things they want is they want trucks not driving through their community. So they want to reroute trucks around the community. So we've, we've identified that as an issue. Um, the city and others that deal with those issues are going to have to go through a process and decide whether that actually happens. Um, so the com community can't subvert that, that normal process that a, a regulation or something would go through. So I don't really see it necessarily a con. Um, it's uh, the community's identifying what they see as issues. We're itemizing them. Some of them we can put some resources to. That's the that's the pro. Um, if there are things that are controversial or that that the local entity does not want to do, the local entity will make that decision. So um, I don't see a real big con. So the, the city has a con has a control, or the people, the citizens of that town, if uh, say. Is another company want to move in that city? They say, no, we don't want to do it because it might increase the. Right. And they can just tell uh, uh, through the council or the city. And right. Not have that business come in that town. Yep. Okay. And and then on the the issue of the worst air quality, um, I don't say this with any pride, but um, uh, it's the LA Air Basin. It's called South Coast Air District and the San Joaquin Valley. We both have the two worst designations in the country for 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 ozone. So we're we're the two extreme non-attainment areas in the country. Uh, which is the highest category and we're the only two um, and then for particulates for pm 2.5 which again is very fine almost soot particles uh, we're a little worse than la um, i was kind of referring to imperial valley or especially kelly's on the border there a population of about three million yeah and uh, all their pollution stuff comes across on our side of the border and creates a big is issue over yeah there. imperial county does imperial valley does have a challenge um I don't know, I, I don't want to rank, you know, better or worse, but I can just tell you that when they generally talk about the worst two parts of the country, it's Los Angeles and the San Joaquin Valley. Mm -hmm. We have uh, some couple, two rivers go through our property. The, the Alamo and the New River come through Mexico and you can see all the nasties inside there yeah. coming through on the side. Thank you very much. All right, thank you all. Okay, we're running late, so we will start the Transportation Planning Policy Committee. Begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. 
and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Trujillo? Crump? Here. Cantu? Alvarado? Mauer? Vallejo? Scrivener? Here. P. Smith? Here. Cryer? Here. B. Smith? I'm here. Couch? Here. Lucinovich? Present. And Reyna? Here. Kersey? Here. Para? Kimmel? Here. And Heckman? Here. Thank you. Okay, this time for public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes, with the authority of the chair to extend the time. Are there any public comments? <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Uh, my name is Karen King. I'm the CEO of Golden Empire Transit District, and I'm here this evening just to let you know that during the month of December, from December 1st through December 31st, uh, GETS fixed route bus service and get a lift service will be fare free. So every ride will be free for our citizens in our, our residents and visitors in our community. So encourage your constituents that travel through Bakersfield to give up their cars for the month, save their money for gifts for their family and friends, and ride the bus. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Merry Christmas from Get. Does that, I have a question. Does that include your, uh, the new? No, it does not. Shucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other public statements? Seeing none, I will move to item four, consent agenda. Opportunity for public comment on the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion of no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. Does anybody wish to remove anything from the consent agenda in the public or members? Seeing none. Second. Roll call vote. Trujillo? Yes. Crump? Aye. Scrivener? Aye. P. Smith? Yes. Cryer? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Couch? Yes. Lucinovich? Aye. Reyna? Yes. Kersey? Abstain. And Kimmel? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 5, 2020 Regional Transportation Improvement Program. Thank you, uh, Chair Smith and directors. Um, early this year, the California, Calif the California Transportation Commission initiated the 2020 RTIP cycle uh, in order to advance regional projects throughout the state. Unfortunately, for this cycle, the CTC, California Transportation Commission, adopted a zero fund estimate, meaning that there w they did not identify any new programming or budget capacity, I should say, to add new programming activity. So the exercise for this RTIP cycle was to 
advanced projects that were in the 2018 STIP or State Transportation Improvement Program and propose to just move them forward as best we can, uh, could. Uh, and so tonight, um, uh, after advancing our draft uh, capital improvement program for you to look at uh, uh, all through the month of September and October, uh, we have the final draft and uh, the capital pr improvement program uh, uh, proposed is uh, reflected in the report as attachment A. And our uh, staff recommendation remains the same. It's consistent with what we did uh, last month. And so tonight we are asking for your approval of this. Um, the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee uh, does recommend approval. And so the action would be adoption of the 2020 RTIP capital improvement program is shown in attachment A and with the request that you authorize the chair to sign resolution 19-40. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, if you'd like. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor or is this roll call? Voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Seeing none. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Caltrans report. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and start with the uh, Route 46 conventional highway segment 4A, which is to widen State Route 46 from a two-lane to a four-lane conventional highway between Lost Hills Road and I-5, uh, as funded by RIP and DEMO. Construction continue reinforced concrete pavement from Power Street to Kern 5 Bridge eastbound. Uh, Construction continues on the Kern 5 southbound on-ramp and the Kern 5 northbound on-ramp and off-ramp. The main flood canal bridge has a false work removal, closure pour, and barrier rail. Traffic delays are expected on the weekends. No lane closure is scheduled for the next two weeks. This project is scheduled for completion June 30th of 2020. The Highway 99 Rehabilitation Project, um, which is uh, 0.3 miles south of Palm Avenue overcrossing to Beardsley Canal Bridge on Route 178 and the 99-178 separation. This is funding by SB1 dollars and SHOP. The work is mainly on the north side of Route 99. Traffic is shifted to the inside lanes, which is lanes 1 and 2. and um, there's a one-lane split in the southbound direction with the KO rail. Work is continuing on the rehab of the existing northbound number three and four lanes. The northbound Rosedale and 24th Street off-ramp has been opened. Contractor closed the California northbound off-ramp and the northbound Buck Owens off-ramp. And these closures will be in effect for 25 days. There's an upcoming ramp closure. Um, State Route 204 on-ramp to the 99 northbound and Olive Drive off-ramp will be closed when work in the previously closed ramps is completed and that will happen for, um, that, that closure will be for 55 days. Uh, the expected start date is in early December for that. Cache Creek Bridge Replacement which is to replace the bridge on Route 58, eight miles east of Tehachapi from the Sand Canyon overhead crossing to 0.5 miles east of Catch Creek. Funding is shop. The, con the contractor will install bridge girders and rebar on the eastbound side of the bridge. The pour for the bridge deck is scheduled for December and the curing time will be seven days. Work on the approach slab is planned for late December, followed by striping and a traffic swap in late January or early February. The work for next month will be to install the eastbound bridge girders and the rebar for the bridge deck. 
the summit overhead bridge rails on Route 58 near to Hatchby at the summit overhead. This is also funded by SHOP. The crews are continuing the false work installation, the bridge overhang demolition, the drill bond dowels, and just began installing overhang rebar. This work is scheduled to be completed November 27th. For the next month, uh, wood forming and framing will be installed. Uh, there will be a pour for the overhang haunch, um, a curing period for that, followed with installation of barrier rebar, installation of wood forming and framing for the barrier, um, a pour barrier, and the curing period. Lairdo Canal Median Gap Closure. The median deck closure near Bakersfield at the Lairdo Canal on Route 99. This is a shop project. Work is currently scheduled for the next 30 days, subject to weather, equipment, labor ability, and environmental impacts. There is a median barrier replacement. The traffic will shift into Stage 2 onto the median shoulders, both in the northbound and southbound directions. Work on outside shoulders will be behind the K-rail. Traffic control related updates include closures anticipated at night but on both the northbound and southbound during December. <coughs> Those will be on Sundays and Thursday nights between 6 p.m. and 8 and uh, sorry, 6 a.m. Both outside and inside shoulders will remain closed through February 15th of 2020. The Bell Terrace overcrossing, construction of an auxiliary lane and replacement of Bell Terrace Bridge on Route 99. The funding is shop as well as demo and local. The new northbound State Route 99 to eastbound State Route 58 connector bridge was open to traffic. The old connector bridge was scheduled for demolition this week. Construction of the retaining wall along the outside shoulder of northbound State Route 99 is continuing. False work for the new Bell Terrace overcrossing was installed. The I-599 bridge separation and pavement rehabilitation project, which is at the uh, I-5 um, junction, uh, I-599 junction to the Panama Lane overcrossing, which is the old US-99. This is a shop project. Work is currently scheduled to lower the lanes and the shoulders for vertical clearance on not Route 99 at Route 5 overcrossing. Other work includes excavation, HMA, continuously reinforced concrete pavement placement on the northbound lane from approximately post mile 5 to post mile 11.2. The contractor is working on replacing the number 3 lane, the shoulder, and has started with continuously reinforced concrete pavement. The northbound ramp uh, will have closures at Herring Road. Stockdale Enos Roundabout, which is the construction of a roundabout at Route 43 in Stockdale Highway. This is funded with oversight, local oversight. The project will replace an existing four way stop with a roundabout at the State Route 43 Enos Lane and Stockdale Highway intersection. The project is now in stage two. This includes working on the north leg of Enos Lane and east and west legs of Stockdale Highway at this point moment the project is approximately 45 percent complete. Route 119 and 43 intersection improvements which is also a roundabout um, at the intersection of routes 119 and 43 in this case funded by shop it was open to traffic yesterday so that's done. Gap closure rehab Roadway rehabilitation, which is a 3R in Bakersfield from Route 58 and 99 separation to Cottonwood Road. The funding is SB1. It's currently in construction. On westbound Route 58, the traffic striping and signs are scheduled to be placed on the first week of December. Stage 3A construction includes Cottonwood on-ramp and Union Avenue off-ramp. Both the Cottonwood on-ramp and the Union Avenue off-ramp will be closed for approximately three months. There's a maintenance access project on Route 178, which is construction of a rock blanket at the Gore areas and the maintenance vehicle pullouts funded by SHOP. 
the rocket blank rock blanket installation is continuing. The contractor is completing all areas not impacted by aerially deposited lead before working on the areas affected by the lead. Acceptance of the project is anticipated in December or January, but a winter suspension for low temperatures is possible. The Cottonwood East Rehab Pavement Rehabilitation is a 2R on Route 58 in Bakersfield from Cottonwood Road under crossing to just east of the Route 58 and 184 separation. This is funded by shop monies. This project is in the final stage of construction. The concrete paving is complete. The contractor is working on grinding, striping, and electrical. Remaining items of work consist of guardrail and erosion control. Work is expected to be complete in mid-December. And finally, the Mojave Maintenance Station. Upgrade facility in Mojave at the Mojave Maintenance Station funded by SHOP. It's an equipment building currently under construction with framing works. The crew building is in the process of painting and installing the roof panels. In the next month, work will continue on the crew building. That's all. Okay, right, so for District 9, hey, thanks for letting me be here. Um, he actually reported on a number of our, on my projects, so <laughs> I won't discuss those. Um, I would like to say that District 9 is about ready to release our draft ITS study, and I'm not sure if you remember, but Kern, Co Kern County completed theirs about a year ago. This is, District 9 is going to be finishing ours. Um, we're going to be releasing a draft probably in December. And at that time, we will be probably presenting it to the TTAC, I think. Uh, that's probably the better forum for it. So that's going to be coming out. Uh, this month, not sure if you're aware, but um, active transportation across California has become a big thing. And my office has kicked off the uh, study for Eastern Kern. And we're going to be looking at gaps where there's no bike facilities and pedestrian facilities. We just started this project um, about two weeks ago. So we'll be contacting Tehachapi, Ridgecrest, and Cal City to work with them on you know, the, how their systems are connecting to the highways out in Eastern Kern. So that's gonna be about a year long project. We'll be pretty much wrapping it up this time next year. And the other thing, so the status, my colleague has handled. And the other thing I wanted to mention is I think the next Kern COG meeting we will be presenting the truck climbing lanes um, going uh, east. So I think that's going to be in January because I think we're dark in December. Oh, yeah, 58 truck climbing lanes. So we will have the district director will be here and our design senior and they will be presenting sort of you know what we've come up with so far. So hopefully... I think that's January's meeting, right? Yeah, we're not here in December. So uh, just be aware that's coming. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I have a I, comment on I that. I have uh, one. Mr. Chairman. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Um, can you go back to um, 204? Um, Golden State Highway is, is going to be closed for 55 days. But that's going to be after the other ramps are open. Is that correct? Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, that was I, I, I believe yes. so. Yeah, that's what I'm. Okay, thank you. That's it. I had a question as well. <clears throat> Actually, more than one. Um, previously, I had asked uh, about that uh, new traffic pattern um, on uh, Highway 46 and um, Highway 99, and the, the rail guard uh, as you are approaching uh, the on ramp uh, going east on 46, and um, the. I was told that they were going to look into it, but I haven't received any report. And then um, last meeting, Mr. Payades was uh, designated as a representative to the COG, and he also had a question regarding um, a um, turning lane and modification on the, on the stop lights at um, Palm Avenue and Griffith and Highway 46 for both of them. So I'm wondering whether anything could be reported at this time. Mr. 
I'll, uh, I'll follow up and get back to you on that. Sure. And then I have one more question, if I may. Um, in Wasco, we recently moved our um, affordable uh, farm worker affordable housing from where it used to be, which was uh, west of the, uh, um, the railroad track, and we moved it to north of Highway 46, uh, behind the, um, um, the hotel that is there. And uh, <clears throat> what has happened now, we have kids that are attending school and they're walking uh, south from that location uh, on, um, on Poplar Avenue and they're crossing Highway 46 against traffic. And it's a very dangerous situation, so I wanted to ask, uh, uh, what is the probability of having a hawk uh, pedestrian system um, placed there so that uh, it would be a um, uh, pedestrian-activated light so that the traffic could stop when somebody is crossing? This is a um, tragedy waiting to happen if we don't do something about it. So I'd like to... Uh, ask you to please look into that and, and report back to us. Will do. We always appreciate when those kinds of safety concerns are brought to our attention. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have an item too. Yes. Um, Mark, on the East Kern um, ATP study, you said yes. you, you were going to coordinate with uh, the three cities. Please uh, coordinate also with the county because we have many unincorporated yes. communities. That Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, the executive director's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I have uh, four items uh, this evening on this agenda. Uh, an inter ITIP hearing, which stands for Interregional Transportation Improvement Program, was held in Fresno on November 15th. You may have read about it. There's an article in your folder about it. Uh, Supervisor Couch, Council Member uh, Trujillo, and uh, Council Member Prout, Prout attended with me and um, Rob Ball. There was well over a dozen elected officials from the Central Valley that showed up, including um, assemb an assembly member, all the way down to city council members, many members of the public, and some just private citizens who had something to say. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, board members, for attending. The bottom line is we have been heard loud and clear. We have a tentative agreement with the state and the state transportation and agency to restore funding to all three projects, uh, fully funding both 99 projects and partially funding the 46 projects. Uh, the reason we were able to come to the agree that agreement is largely due to us speaking up. Not just us, but the entire Central Valley coming together um, in a nonpartisan way and, and letting the state know that it was unacceptable to not fund these projects. And, and I'll be glad to let Supervisor Couch or Council Member Trujillo add on to that before I finish my comments. I'll say that it, it also helps that Aaron has the relationships he has at, uh, at Caltrans. So um, you thanked us, but we'll, I'll thank you, Aaron, because I, I don't know. It became pretty obvious to me that we have the right person with the right relationships in the right spot um, helping us. And so you were invaluable in that process. Thank you. Um, yes, also I do want to thank you, Aaron, for everything that you have been doing and um, just keeping everyone in the loop with things that are going on and so we could be more supportive whenever we need it. Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> uh, a few more items. Um, the day before our trip up to Fresno on November 15th, on November 14th, Kern Cog organized a tour <coughs> of Kern, Kern County's growing goods movement industry in Delano Shafter around our Bakersfield Airport and at the Tahone Commerce Center. The tour included 4 million square feet of new warehousing currently under construction thanks to um, Council Member Grace Vallejo from Delano, uh, staff at Shafter, and KEDC, and also our own staff for helping coordinate that event. 
CTC is meeting in a couple of weeks in Riverside on December 4th and 5th, where they will likely give an update on the ITIP. I will be attending that meeting. This um, next item is important for several of you. Yes, I see uh, Supervisor Couch has a question. Is that, is that going to be when the CTC actually takes an action on the tentative agreement you have with them? Uh, Supervisor Couch, no, the, the, the final ITIP is due to the CTC on December 15th. Okay. So they will likely take action in final action in March. Okay. And, and I will give you plenty of notice if what is in that final document is not what we have okay. agreed to and if we need to attend that meeting. Thank you. Um, finally, for, um, for all of you and specifically for Councilman Smith and Supervisor Scrivener, the, the San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council meeting and multi-agency working group meeting that um, Council Member Smith, Supervisor Scrivener, and Council Member Pr Prout are part of, will <coughs> have a meeting on January 17th, 2020. So please mark your calendars. It's a Friday. Uh, if you want to carpool, uh, staff will be going. But that will be the first meeting of that AB 101 group that is likely to um, set the rules for the next several years and uh, lay the groundwork for how that money will be distributed. Uh, subject to any of your questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, this, mem this meeting is adjourned. And before I start the next one, I have something up here for Mr. Pete Smith, who's going to retire. And he may not make it through the whole meeting, so I'm going <laughs> to ask him to come up now. Sh shuffle on up, Pete, you know, and we'll get you out a little sooner. I met Pete in uh, 2005 when I was founding and starting Bike Bakersfield and, and you know, I was going to change the world for bicycling and Pete said, good luck, you know, and his, <laughs> in, yeah, yeah, that was it. And <laughs> he's always been very encouraging, you know, <laughs> through the years. Thank you for your help and thank you for your 31 years. I will miss you uh, shuffling around downtown, Pete. So you know you can still you can still come down. <laughs> okay, uh, the meeting of Kern Cog. We have the same roll call, I believe. Stays the same. Public comments is the same. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, uh, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Anybody like to pull an item from the consent agenda in the public or members? Seeing none. Motion no consent. Second. So roll call vote. Trujillo? Yes. Crum? Aye. Scrivener? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Cryer? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Couch? Yes. Lucinovich? Aye. And Reyna? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item uh, Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, uh, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. I have a few items on this agenda. Uh, we held a joint meeting with uh, SCAG on October uh, 30th. We try to do that every, roughly every year. We held the meeting uh, at Tohon Ranch headquarters, which was about halfway for most people. Supervisor Couch, Council Member um, Bob Smith, Council Member Crump, Council Member uh, Grace Vallejo, and Mayor Jose Garola attended, as well as staff members. We met with um, the new Executive Director of SCAG, Kome Ajis. Gise, who uh, has been a colleague of mine for over 30 years, and several of their elected officials. It was a productive meeting. Uh, and any of the attendees uh, who were there would like to say anything, I'll be glad to. Nope. Oh, if not, um, in your packet tonight, and I'll go over what else is in your packet, is uh, 
your regional award nomination packet. So this is just a reminder if you or any members of your community or members of your city or county have uh, people you or people groups or um, that you would like to recognize, the nominations are due November 26th. And speaking of that, if we need uh, to have a meeting to go over those nom nominations, and usually um, I'll know within about two weeks if we receive um, enough applications, we may have to pare those applications down. So uh, what I'm looking for is volunteers to potentially, not necessarily definitely, meet to go over the regional awards on December 19th which would have been our uh, next meeting date at 5 p.m. You can either let me know now if you would like to volunteer for that or get back to me in the next few weeks. I'm, I'm open to. Okay. I have council okay. members, both council member Smiths. Makes it easy. Huh? And council member Crump. And I might, I might be able to. supervisor Couch and council member Cryer. And again, we will send you the information um, as we prepare it, our recommendations, and also our recommendation on whether we need uh, to meet or not. <clears throat> a couple more items. There's a order form for our 50th anniversary um, polo shirts in your folder. If you can, please fill that out before you leave and leave it with Becky. Also in your folder tonight, an article um, from Bill Deaver, who many of you know, former mayor of Cal City and general good guy, talking about truck climbing lanes on 58 and also the opening, I believe, of, not I believe, the opening of Kramer Junction, which happened over the last month, which is a huge deal for Kern County, even though Kramer Junction is technically in San Bernardino County. Article on the high-speed rail Shafter to Bakersfield route. An article on the um, hearing that we discussed a few minutes ago. Uh, current Council of Governments news and events. Timeline covering November through February. The schedule of cash disbursements for October and the previously mentioned flyer for the regional awards. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any member statements? Seeing none, we I, are. I'd like, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Thank happy you. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> and Merry Christmas, because we probably won't be here in December. Yep. Bob, uh, Ch Mr. Chairman, if you could. Uh, Say we, we will be dark in December. Confirm, we will be dark in December. 